but bright Sunday morning, the chimes of 17th century bells peal across an ancient city. Yaroslavl is a testament to Russian strength and endurance. For a thousand years it has survived a turbulent and sometimes agonising history. The Mongols invaded its fortress, the Bolsheviks closed its churches, and economic reformers destroyed its factories. Today, Yaroslavl is a wounded casualty of Russia's stumbling transition from communism. Most of its privatised businesses are ruined. Social services have almost collapsed. Many of its pensioners are reduced to begging. But the surprising thing about this place is not how bad things have become, it's how certain people are that they'll get through these latest troubles. Yaroslavl doesn't just embody Russia's problems, it also shows its potential, because in the midst of this deepest crisis, there are stirrings of renewal. Yaroslavl's biggest factory should be in as dire a state as anything in Russia. But its profits have never been higher. It's even hiring hundreds of new workers every month. Elisaveta Kurmatova has worked here for more than 30 years, X-raying tyres for quality control. For the first time since Perestroika, she no longer fears for the future. С этого года у нас лучше стало, и зарплату стали вовремя получать. Директор проводит сейчас собрание, обещают нам, что будет повышение зарплаты. Мы надеемся на лучшее. Надежды такие факты. That a factory like this could prosper also gives hope for the rest of Russia's Soviet-built industry. Нам нет преград ни в море. The Yaroslavl tyre factory was set up in 1932 as a state-run enterprise. It prospered in the days of heavy industry, even inventing synthetic rubber. But the factory wilted as the world economy passed it by. When it was privatised in the early 90s, it was stuck with the same rusting equipment and outmoded work practices. By last year, the factory couldn't even afford to pay wages. It was paying its workers with tyres. We got the tires, then we sold the tires, and we lived in those times. We gave them products. Hello, In July, a new management team took over, headed by 32-year-old Nikolai Tankov. Самостоятельно, то есть никто им не занимался в планах стратегических целей каких-то, в планах значит, кадровой работы, в планах прибыльности его, чтобы завод был прибыльным. Вот. А так вот, как катилось, как катилось, все как вот при социализме, если раньше была плановая экономика, за что-то отвечали, то потом как это бросили этим заниматься, никто ничем не занимался. Russia's economic meltdown could have finished the factory. Instead, it helped to save it. As the national currency, the ruble, collapsed, the tyres were suddenly a quarter the cost of their imported competition. By modernising their marketing and work practices, the management was able to take advantage of this newfound competitiveness. Но зато они дешевле, и просто русские товары стали покупаться очень активно. А, здорово, здорово. Elisaveta can't afford any luxuries, but now she's being paid in rubles, not tires, she can throw together some traditional hospitality. 
Elisaveta invited us to her apartment for a meal of blinis and sweets with her 81-year-old mother, Ala Dvaretskaya. Her wage sees her mother through those months when the pension never arrives. The tyre factory has been central to the family's life since it opened 67 years before. Anna looks back on those Soviet years as a golden time. Anna still belongs to the factory's choir. Every so often they get together to entertain other factory veterans and to reminisce. The years of reform have severely strained the close bonds that communities like this once enjoyed. Factories were always much more than places where people worked. Under the Soviet system, a factory could also be where your kids went to school, where your family went to the doctor. It could even run the cinema you went to for entertainment. And when a factory died, everything that wound a community together went as well. Today, Yaroslavl is trying to revive those links. The tyre factory no longer pays for a school and kindergarten it once ran. But now it's profitable, it does help the old factory hospital. The hospital treats the factory's 5,000 staff and their families for free. The state is supposed to provide half the funding, but rarely does. Only the factory subsidy keeps the staff paid and the hospital stocked with medicine. The radiologist, Yevgenia Orlova, can now use high-tech equipment unheard of in most Russian hospitals. But the cold principles of the market apply. Yevgenia has nine years training and 30 years of experience, and she's paid less than a cleaner. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Most people in Yaroslavl gave up any hope of being rich a long time ago. Hey! The happiness that can be found here comes from family, friends, and the dependable rhythm of seasons. Many Russians feel lost and humiliated by their country's descent from a superpower to a developing nation. But in Yaroslavl, there's a growing pride in their more distant past. Yaroslavl's folk dancing ensemble is now rehearsing for summer, when the Volga River thaws, bringing boatloads of tourists. The ensemble belongs to the Yaroslavl Railway, but it's their commercial concerts that pay the staff's wages and help renovate the theatre. For the dancers, it's a labour of love. 
Even two of the company's stars, Olga Petrina and Irina Shagina, don't get paid for performing. They survive on their day jobs, and in modern Russia, that's a daunting challenge. We met Olga and Irina on Saturday morning at Yaroslavl's only fast food outlet. It was a rare treat. Olga, on the left, earns 700 rubles a month as a full-time teacher, the equivalent of 35 US dollars. Irina works for the Department of Labor, earning even less. The meal costs more than a tenth of their monthly wage. But they're not complaining. Expectations here are brutally realistic. It's Saturday afternoon and the junior hockey team is gearing up for a big match. The senior team, the Torpedoes, shot to the top of the National League two years ago. Coach Sergei Kanievsky is looking forward to more success. But some believe the city's sporting obsession could be its costliest mistake. Yaroslavl's governor, Anatoly Lovsitsyn, has taken a leaf from Tsarist history and ordered the construction of a palace. It's to be called the Ice Palace. Yaroslavl is spending far more on its construction than it will spend on the poor and homeless. Ну, во-первых, я не знаю, что такое дорого. Вся стоимость его 50 тысяч, 50 миллионов долларов. Это дворец на 9 тысяч зрителей. Это концертно-спортивный комплекс. Это не ледовый дворец. Это будет впервые вот такое коммерческое предприятие, где будет все работать на то, чтобы зарабатывать. А здесь? Ну, думаю, придумаю. Elvira Mazhenya, a local journalist who's been covering the construction, disagrees. She believes the governor is indulging in the new national pastime, squandering other people's money. Вот если представить семью, где не хватает денег для стариков, где детям не могут купить то, что не хотят, что дети не едят фруктов, и семья покупает себе какую-то дорогую игрушку, там машину. BMW покупает или там Volvo. Но это, конечно, все скажут, что эта семья просто безумцы в ней живут. По существу, город и область это такая же семья. Russia has been let down badly by its post-communist rulers. Thanks to them, most news is still bad. Every week, City Television reports on unpaid wages, late pensions and political bickering. Два месяца. Такова задолженность в нашей области выплаты пенсии. Сегодня в Ярославле закрывают ноябрь. Осталось добыть еще около 9 миллионов рублей и можно приниматься за декабрь. В течение календарного месяца пенсионный фонд справляется лишь с месячным объемом. А хвост задолженности как был, так и есть. Money that could have revived Russia's industry, or at least cushioned the impact of change, has been wasted or simply stolen. Historic opportunities have been missed, perhaps for good. But in towns like Yaroslavl, private citizens might just succeed where governments have failed. Instead of shipping its money offshore, the tyre factory is spending millions on modernising its equipment. In the long term, it will compete on more than a falling ruble. Вот на в дальнейшем, конечно, мы будем закупать уже оборудование, которое отвечает мировым стандартам, мировому уровню. Вот это же касается легковых шин с металлокордом в брекере. Вот, и мы будем устанавливать линию ничем не хуже таких фирм, известных как Pirelli, Nokia, Goodyear. То есть это в планах. Despite the gloom, many people still feel hope. Having endured so much in the past, they're confident that one day they'll have a future. Надеемся на будущее. 
что будут деньги платить, что будем получать, что будем работать, растить детей, внуков, отдыхать. Надеемся. По-вашему, все будет хорошо. Ну, хочется надеяться на это. Но не хочется о плохом думать. Анна Сергеевна, что вы думаете о будущем? О будущем? Вы оптимист? Уже дело в том, что у меня будущего уже немного осталось. А я хочу, чтобы мои дети жили хорошо. Вот это моя надежда, чтобы... Я очень довольна, что они имеют все-таки работу, твердо стоят на ногах. Это уже меня до какой-то степени успокаивает. At the end of another week, Yaroslavl's Christians gather to seek solace in faith and to give thanks for blessings. If Russia is to revive, it will most likely be through ordinary people and their small but determined struggles. Their hope and strength are as good a reason as any to believe in Russia's future. Yaroslavl may be battered, but it's not beaten yet. <laughs>